All right, everybody, welcome back to Cool's Interviews. Today, I think we're going to go over quite a bit of different topics, but uh, quite a bit about Stonehenge, hopefully. I'm quite excited to talk about that one. But our guest here, Maria, has a lot of experience there, written a couple books. So, Maria, for anyone that doesn't know who you are, do you want to explain a little bit about your background and uh, what you do? Sure. I'm a second generation master dancer. My father was very well known in the country for decoding ancient sites and dousing for earth energies and ley lines and grid systems. And so I really followed in his footsteps and I've been writing books now for about 20 years. So I've been in this for a long time and it's a passion as well. I love going to ancient Egypt. Well, who wouldn't? <laughs> and I, I love going to ancient sites like Avebury and Stonehenge. Glastonbury and places in France as well worldwide. Oh very cool yeah so you said you got started at a uh, young age then? Yes I mean for me it all began when my late father just took us to a stone circle and you know we were kids so we'd play around and it was it was great and then uh, it was about sort of finding out about why did the ancients place that stone circle there? What is special about that land? And that's where the earth energies and the lays come into play. So it was learning about not just the kind of archaeology of the site, which I have studied at Oxford University as well, and Bath University, so I can talk in archaeological language, but my heart is in the mystical side where it's more than just dates it's more than just it's placed there so that's what I look into I delve into what is seen like a place is at Stonehenge but what's unseen below the ground in terms of earth energies right and a lot of these they're in the shape of a circle what is important about that shape as far as the geometry that's a really good question. Once you have a circle, you you have sacred geometry. You could divide the circle into 12, for example, like the 12 signs of the zodiac or 12 notes of a musical scale. And you can start to have sacred geometry and pi and laws like that. But in terms of occultism or metaphysics, whatever you guys are more comfortable with word wise, then the circle generates within itself concentric circles. That's called form energy. And we've measured this as well. And it generates circles outside of itself. So in magical terms, what a magician would do if he cast a circle of salt, of chalk, of stone, it generates form energy of those inner bands. That's one of the first laws of magic in terms of studies like at the Hermetic schools, for example, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. It's about that form energy. So really, the circle also is about eternity. It has no beginning. It has no end. It has very, very deep symbolism and also why a circular shape, despite the form energy that a circle generates naturally, a circular shape is produced by very, very deep water that is under sustained pressure. And that's what water diviners have known for many, many generations. So the, the ancients were looking for this circular type of earth energy generated by deep water and placing stones on top of that pattern. And underground water produces other patterns as well. So it's really the surface patterns that I think the ancients were finding and utilizing the circular shape. Oh, very, very interesting. You also mentioned ley lines. For any of the viewers or listeners listening that have no idea what that is, do you want to explain that a little bit too? Absolutely. Ley lines. What are they and what, why are they there? <laughs> it's often questions I get, get asked. Well, back in the 1930s, it was Alfred Watkins who wrote a book called The Old Straight Track, who said that you have ancient sites in alignment, literally in a straight line. So imagine Stonehenge, another site and another site. He said if five or more sites were in a straight line, that decreed a lay. Some lays are just topographical, like joining dots. Yep, you could join dots with sites. That's called a topographical lay. But if a lay has energy, which uh, a lot of people suggest that they have, that's called uh, an E-line, an energy line. But more 
recently with research, it's been noticed that if you have planet Earth, she's a sphere. She's not a perfect circle. She's more tangerine shaped, so to speak. And then you place the five Plutonian solids on top of that, like the cube shape, the tetrahedron shape and, and those, and you place them all together are around the earth, then they generate primary lines that seem to link up ancient sites worldwide. And they have secondary lines as well. So you get primary lines in that Platonian solid model of lays. And also you have much shorter lays as well. You can have long lays that go right the way around the world and create a great circle, or you can have some just a few miles long that don't fit into either of those models. So lays are, are many things, but they are straight lines. You talked about some of these sides being on them as far as like Stonehenge, obviously, but is like Gobekli Tepe and maybe America Stonehenge also on these ley lines? Absolutely. I mean, if you take America Stonehenge, for example, not far from Salem, then and you project a line to Stonehenge, the owner did that, Dennis Stone. And I'm really pernickety. I'm saying you, you don't just go to the altar stone. I found exactly which trilothon that lay went to. And that's an inner setting for the listeners that's going, what's a trilothon at Stonehenge? It's two stones with a stone on top and they weigh about 95 tons. So so yes, you can link sites from one part of the world to another, even if you go to another site in ancient America, because I, I doubt ancient America as well, I'll be in Charco Canyon in late August, for example, and you go from Charco Canyon in New Mexico near Four Corners, that also links into the Giza complex, which is the Great Pyramid. Yeah, Chaco has been one on our, our list. We've been meaning to get to it because we go to New Mexico yearly. We just haven't gone to that little section of New Mexico yet. So is Chaco pretty cool then? Chaco goes by a design canon because you could ask the archaeologists, and there's many very good ar American archaeologists to do with Chaco Canyon, and they also they get baffled by why is it a D shape, Pueblo Bonito, which was four stories high and contained up to 650 rooms. That's the main building, a great house, which is now seen by some of the American archaeologists as not being a palace, not being a great house, but being a a temple so they've now really moved on why a d-shape and why are some of the houses the other great houses there's 12 that sort of surround charcoal why are they d-shaped again let's go back to earth energy and what do we find a d-shaped almost horseshoe sh shape of earth energy that Pueblo Bonito was the template of. Not all of the great houses are on that actual earth energy. It became a template because it was on it. And I also argued with uh, many American archaeologists that the Great North Road, which goes right the way up through Charco, right the way heading up to what's called Aztec ruins. You're going to have to go to Aztec ruins if you, if you go to uh, Charco Canyon it's a straight road well what have I just been talking about lays that's the great north road is an actual lay that you have there now there's another type of lay which is the most important type of ley line and that's where you have a straight line with two earth currents entwining it like this creating like a dna strand shape or a caduceus it's been likened to by many geomancers and what does charco have it has all of that. <laughs> yeah. So it's on par with the, the sites in England and other places like Turkey. I mean, you could list country after country and, and Egypt alike, but they does have this living earth energy system. In England, there's a huge lake, 300 miles long, going across southern Britain with two earth currents entwining it. And they kind of targeted churches and they became known as the Mary and Michael currents that entwine the St. Michael ley line. Well, when I was at uh, Charco Canyon and discovered these two currents, and I thought, we well, can't call it a Christian name. You're in, you can't call them Mary and Michael. And so intuitively, I chose deer and wolf. And then when I even looked into the phonetic meaning of Charco, it means hunting ground. 
So I think that was quite appropriate. And these earth currents target numerous places that surround Charco all the way up to Colorado as well. Oh, very, very interesting. Yeah, our buddy Matt has been big on uh, wanting to get it to Chaco. So hopefully here uh, soon we can get there and check it out. You've talked about dowsing and we haven't talked to anyone yet that's talked about dowsing. So do you want to explain uh, what that is and how that works? Absolutely. Like I said, I'm a second generation master dowser. And when we think of dowsing or water divining, that's one aspect of dowsing. Then we think of holding a twig <laughs> like this and finding underground water. And I have here just beside me for your viewers. I mean, I use a copper rod like this to douse for earth energies and it's got a sleeve on so i don't influence it yeah i'm not holding the inside directly it's called a sleeve dousing rod copper is very sensitive metal we use it in our homes to conduct electricity it's a conductor so when i'm looking for earth energies you ask your rod what you're going to be looking for so i don't just wander around with dousing rods i'm, I'm looking for particular types of underground water particular types of grid lines and so on and so forth and if you're using two rods when your rods detect something and obviously I'm going to move them just to show your uh, viewers then they go to found position which is that crossed rods or they repel outwards like that very very fast I mean I'm doing it in slow motion but if I was actually down it go like that and that's how you can find something and because you know what you're looking for you're not randomly dousing then you can start to decode land and that's what i do in america and england somebody could buy some land and say could you decode it for me because some earth energies are relaxing and calming well you don't want to work above those then do you you're not going to put your office there because you'd be so chilled out you probably wouldn't be doing anything and then there's certain earth energies that are more stimulating it. So you can decode an, an entire area and live in harmony with Gaia. And that's my vision is to be able to live in harmony with her because the ancients recognize some very healing earth energies. When we've measured these, they are around about seven to 10 hertz. That's your brain in relaxed mode in alpha mode. OK, so now imagine that we could put a, a healing section of a hospital above that, a relaxing section of a school above that. We don't have to just go to places like Stonehenge, which is great, but we can start to look to our own backyards, as you guys say. We call them our gardens. You, I know that you say backyards and then we can start to say, OK, that's a relaxing area. I'll put my garden furniture there uh, etc etc so the the earth is amazing she emits all types of earth energies some of which are toxic uh, that you don't want to live above and it's been found by german doctors in the 1970s that particular types of earth energy which we call geopathic stress and geopathic stress is basically toxic earth energies and they can be carcinogenic long-term living above them and by long term i mean 10 10 years maybe five years you know you have to have a prolonged time above that and it weakens the immune system kind of along those lines and maybe a little off topic there but have you seen like haunting cases above these certain negative spots Absolutely. I mean, that was discovered in the 1970s by a Cambridge Don. He was a professor of Cambridge who turned his hand to Dowson. He was called Tom Lethbridge. And what Tom Lethbridge did in paranormal activity from regular hauntings or anniversary hauntings, you know, the same time year, year after year, he found that commonly it was the crossing point of two underground streams that to a homeopath, water has a memory. OK, that's a real principle of homeopathy. Uh, Lethbridge applied that to underground water and that if there was a certain 
act of you know violence for instance above that it's like the area encodes it and then plays it back so some people will see hauntings associated to that another master dowser called guy underwood he looked into why people feel you know oh they go to a certain place oh i don't like it i feel something here well what is that feel something and again he noticed two underground currents or lays ley lines that cross literally like that in a cross shape at a 45 degree angle they are associated with hauntings or just that feeling of being very uncomfortable which is called the haunting frequency round about sort of 18 hertz some people suggest it's its frequency tone yeah yeah no that's very interesting that's it's a very interesting thing that we can look at when we're doing hauntings, like that type of talk. Sam, before we get into Stonehenge, do you have any questions you want to get into? I mean, since we've talked about certain places, you talked about um, asking permission at sites. Like, is there like a ritual for that or how do you go about doing that? That's a really good question, Sam. I mean, I'm uh, obviously from Celtic lands and I've studied to be a Druid. And so in the Celtic way is where you would ask permission of the land to douse or to look into paranormal activity. You tell the land what you are going to be doing. Do you see what I mean? I'm going to be dousing today. I'm going to be doing uh, this. And then you ask the ancestors permission. It's very important that you ask the, those that came before you permission. And we have a, a say in spirit of place, that ambiance of place. And so we ask permission of the spirit of place and the guardian throughout all different types of mythologies and legends you always have a guardian of place whether it's the guardian of the underworld or it's the guardian of stonehenge so we ask permission like that and it was interesting to note when i first started going to egypt many many years years ago that the egyptians did that as well because when i was talking to the group and they said we were just about to say that we think it's important to ask the ancestors and and the the spirit of place so i think it's not just a druid do you see what i mean that would do that and when i have spoken to um it was grandfather black elk he came over many years ago to avebury and i had the good fortune of meeting him inside of a stone circle and i was talking druid ways to him so to speak and he said that's what we do we always ask the ancestors OK, so, I mean, I, like I say, I think I'm talking as, as a druid, but it's much, much wider than that. That is pretty cool. I mean, we might have to start doing that when we investigate at certain places. Do you know what, Sam, when you start to do that, it's almost like the land is saying, ah, I know what you're going to be doing. I might even show you something more. It was how I found the elongated skulls of Stonehenge. I didn't do what normal dowsers do, show me this, show me that. I did my asking of the ancestors, etc. And then I just asked a map of Stonehenge in my living room. You know, I just asked a map, show me what you want me to find. I turned it all around and it just literally kept going to this one long barrel. And I thought, well, let's investigate that. And then found out it was the, the elongated skulls, which previous to my find, nobody else had ever spoken about because nobody knew that they were long skull. And I truly believe that's because the ancestors were with me and they said, now looking to us. Okay. So you asked like prior to going there, opposed from on site? Exactly. So before I go to a place, like say I've got a group that I'm going to be taking to Stonehenge, I have a quiet moment where I tune into Stonehenge and then I will say what I'm doing. I'm going to be bringing a group to Stonehenge. Uh, I would like to ask the Guardian's permission, etc., etc. Please accept me. And just by doing that, the land starts to resonate with you. I truly, but I truly believe that because it's, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that I have found all of the shamans of Stonehenge, all of the shield maidens. Nobody ever talked about a woman being a shield maiden. It was the Vikings that did that. And I found all of these different burials surrounding Stonehenge and other sites. And some other authors were saying to me, well, how come you find all of, uh, all of this, Maria? You know, why? you it's not me it's the ancestors 
uh, guide in me. Do you see what I mean? That's how mm -hmm. I see it. I don't see it as me. I see it as the guidance. And it's a beautiful relationship then. It's, it's literally about building trust with those people that went before. And when that trust is there, the heart opens up for their story and their song. So I'd imagine if you did that for paranormal activity, you'd create that big bond between place, yeah? And the power of place. Definitely gonna have to try that and see what happens. My other one before we get into Stonehenge is um, talking about the pendulums and how some people don't know the correct way of doing the pendulums and like kind of show other people the incorrect way. Would you mind explaining like the proper use and way of them? In a normal pendulum that people would use to ask questions of, they tend to ask yes or no questions of a pendulum to get a yes or no answer. That's called information dousing. So an example of information dousing is I'd have my pendulum in neutral position, that's just literally dangling, and then I would ask it a, a question, you know, and if it goes clockwise, uh, that normally means yes, and if it goes counterclockwise, that means no. But information dousing does have its flaws, and it can lead you on a merry dance. The only person that really investigated uh, this, and it's shocking to find out who investigated Dowson, was Himmler. And he said there was a missing link of why it goes wrong. And he claimed that he found he had a Dowson Academy. Yeah, that the allies were going to really find because Winston Churchill was a druid fact and so they had this whole mystical uh, occult side to to the war and uh, Himmler burnt the the building down so what we say in the correct way of dowsing is okay you've got your pendulum you've asked it a question and it says yes yep and so I then have to check that. And it was the master dowser, Tom Graves, that came out with this many, many decades ago. So you got your yes, and then you say to your pendulum, is this a Hermes response? What's Hermes? What's a Hermes response, you may say? Hermes is the trickster aspect of creation. He'll lead you a merry dance. He's called Loki in the Norse Viking. He's called Mercury uh, in, you know, Roman mythology. And Hermes is the, the Greek name for him. And he is a bit of a trickster. So really, you're asking the universe, is this a trick question? <laughs> is it a trick answer? And so if it goes yes, well, you've just been tricked by the trickster aspect of creation. But if it goes no, you can guarantee that's more probability that is a true reflection. So that's what came out. I think that came out about 40 or 50 years ago now. And professional master dowsers would add that in. That would make sense because you never know. Exactly, exactly. And information dowsing only kicked off in the 1960s. It doesn't have a long legacy as you would probably think it does. Uh, it, it doesn't. It, it really kicked off yeah, in the 60s. Yeah, the, uh, the whole war aspect is something that we wanted to talk about uh, because we, we've talked about Gerald Gardner and how they went out during the war and they kind of did a protection spell. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, Churchill and then the Germany had a bunch of like witches that they were trying to do stuff with. And I was like, well, it's kind of a different way to talk about the war that I don't think gets talked about a lot. <laughs> uh, just to add something in that, you know, when a Poland was invaded by, you know, the, the, the horrible regime called the Nazis, the first thing that Himmler did was he cordoned off a stone circle called Odry, O-D-R-Y. It's not pronounced like that in Polish. I got totally told off when it was like Odry. I'm saying it phonetically. And he cordoned that off for uh, a pilgrimage that where people would go to, you know? So that was what they had their eyes on and why. 
Why that stone circle? Well, it's, it's a series of stone circles, actually, because of the Earth energies. Earth energies have two frequencies of color associated to them. That particular system has the, the white frequency of Earth energy. Imagine Earth energy having a color coming out of the ground, a dominant color, rather than just being a line on a piece of paper. And it had the white frequency and the red frequency. Well, that's polarity. You've got it in terms of chakra colors, the crown chakra and the root or the base chakra. And that's why they changed the color of their flag as well to red and white it was reflecting the power of the earth and then they cited certain buildings all over associated to those two frequencies who taught me that a german master dancer so i've been trained by chinese geomants european master dancers and and to be very honest the germans really do know their land they really do, and they know how to resonate with it for good or for bad. I mean, it's what you do to the land is your intent, you know. I mean, hopefully mine is very good and it's very white and it's very light. But so, some people's are definitely not. Well, and you were talking about circles again, and it made me think of like domes, like capital domes or church domes. Do you think that's not a coincidence that they're all circle as well? That's a really, really good question, because when you go back much, much earlier than the church dome in a long barrow and a long barrow, if you imagine, it's got an earthen section here and it's got an opening where you can stand in or where you could meditate in like a chamber, like an America Stonehenge. For those that want to Google what an English barrow looks like, it kind of looks like that. And all of the roofs there were corbelled dome shaped we call it core board in archaeological terms but basically they're, they're a dome and that generates or enhances the earth energy beneath it and it creates a, a, a frequency that's uh, called in geomantic terms uh, a very powerful form of energy so it's no mistake that the white house has that mosques have that some synagogues and it, it came from the neolithic in the long barrows going back to six thousand years ago yeah i was thinking about that i was like i wonder if there's a connection uh but get getting the stonehenge what was like your first experience there my first experience of Stonehenge was when there was no security guards there and uh, I was a little kid, probably about seven or eight, and just having fun running around uh, Stonehenge. Today, it's cordoned off. It has security guards there. And it is no mistake that Stonehenge is surrounded by 16 military establishments. And those military establishments are on a place called the Salisbury Plain. The Salisbury Plain, I equate to Area 51 in Nevada because it's run by the military and some areas are no go to civilians. That's where Stonehenge is placed. But tourists don't see that side. They're led in that side. But when I take people to Stonehenge, I take them through the military barracks and they're going, we've not seen this on National Geographical. Well, no, because they want to hide that side. So that is very surrounded by secrecy, uh, Stonehenge in, in that regard. So today's experience is very, very different to what it was like, you know, 30 years ago or so or 40 years ago, which is a shame. Yeah, it's it's funny you bring up Area 51. The uh, cause tourists go there and they always like try to get as close as they get. And then apparently they had a big festival. Do people try to do that with the military stuff there? Do you know what the last festival was in about the the eighties? And I remember uh, going uh, going to that. It turned out to be a battle as well with um, you know the festival goers and the police. It all it all went uh, a bit nasty. But uh, it was great fun because in the fields uh, opposite, you just had this massive marquee saying Babylon. <laughs> and that's where all the kind of, you know, good bands uh, were, were playing. And it became in its close to its 12th year. In England, if you have something running for 12 years, it's a tradition. You can't stop it. Yeah, it becomes a, what's called a tradition. So it's coming up to that time and they didn't want that because everybody was having uh, a good time. And we can't have that in England, can we? we <laughs> that's what, what it was seen as. And also it opened up St Stonehenge to a lot of people's consciousness. 
as well uh, through the the festivals that were were there and English Heritage still open it up free at the summer solstice uh, but apart, apart from that, if you want really, pro I have what's called private access. I take people, not like how the public see them, by walking around the stones and you're about uh, 500 feet away from the stones. I take them inside. And where I'm very uh, known by uh, English Heritage security guards, they, they turn a blind eye to some of my little goings on uh, at, at Stonehenge. So we're, we're in good company because some of the stones are very, very powerful with their en en energy emissions. For example, one stone, it's recumbent today. That means it's fallen down and it has ridges on it, two ridges. And if it was upright, because like I say, it's fallen down now, stone number 50, 59, if anybody wants to look that up in the archaeological model, the two ridges, the spines, which have been deliberately carved, are human height to like put your spine against. I call them spine stones. And I remember being, you're not allowed to touch the stones at Stonehenge. You know, they oh, don't touch the stones. And so I skim in my hand along the uh, spine and saying there's uh, energy heat emissions. And everybody was going, oh, my God, I can feel heat. So the security guard came over, and this was before they got to know me, and go, what are you doing on that stone? I said, it's got heat emissions uh, coming from it and we're taking it in turns and we're not touching the stone. We're skimming uh, above it. So he said, oh, let me, me have a go. So he took off his glove and went like that and he just, he swore. So I'm not going to swear and cuss on your show, but he just went, I cannot b believe this. The stones have power at Stonehenge. That's what makes it an incredible temple. Yeah, and that leads into like, what was its purpose? Yes, I mean, what what is it about Stonehenge? That is a really great question, which I address in uh, quite a few chapters in my book. In the 12th century here in England, you had um, the clergy, for example, they were called Geoffrey of Monmouth. Yeah, Geoffrey of Monmouth was a writer around about the 12th century, and he was collecting all the old manuscripts and writing about the kings of Britain. So he wrote a, a, a book, it's still in print today, crazy, because it's from the 12th century, called The History of the Kings of Britain. And it was Geoffrey of Monmouth writing then that reminded us of Merlin. King Arthur. So all of that was written in his book. And he said, time and again, people are saying no stone at Stonehenge doth not have healing power. And he even said how they went to Stonehenge to have healing. You take some water, you'd go towards a stone and then you'd mix a little bit of the stone with water. And then he names all of the cures that that would come up with. It could heal, for example, the falling sickness, which was then called epilepsy. It can heal this. It can heal that. There was lists in that book and not just him. Other ancient writers said it was a healing temple. Now I'm going to take you inside of Stonehenge and we're by one of those trilithons, those really big ones right at the heart of Stonehenge. Stone number 51 for all the geeks that like stone numbers out there. Very special stone. I was really lucky because as I grew up, my father inherited all of the manuscripts of other master dancers. So I've got things going back to 1899. And in one section about Stonehenge, it was said that uh, this master dancer was talking to the curator there. That's somebody that looks after the stones, may take people around. He has a job to look after those uh, stones. And he was the custodian of the site. Well, he said stone 51 has a hole going down the stone. So imagine you could put your hand down two feet inside of the stone and he said every time you you turned your back it used to fill up with water and people used to queue by that stone for eczema they used to rub the water and they tried to figure out where this water came from was it coming from underground no was it coming from above dripping even in the hottest drought he said our eyewitness the custodian of stonehenge in the 50s that stone produces magical water. So what did 
the then Ministry of Works do? The Ministry of Works was a government department. Today, we call it English Heritage. They're the custodians of Stonehenge and the National Trust. But then it was a, a government department. Well, you can't have healing going on at Stonehenge. They plug that socket up two feet inside that stone with cement and plastic. So today, it, will, it won't produce stuff uh, any water for healing so again we're looking at stonehenge as being partly healing and that has like i said it's been documented ever since the 12th century and those manuscripts were much older than the 12th century probably going back to 900 a.d no very cool so with the what we see today has been a reconstruction right it's not it's been replaced because when they at one point it was like all laying down right so stonehenge has been reconstructed ever since 1901 by colonel hawley he was the the first to the greater trilophon that's the biggest stone set in at stonehenge it was leaning and he put it upright and then in the 1960s well late 50s 60s professor richard atkinson he went on a mission to put lots of the stones back upright because a trilophon had fallen over in the 19th century and he re-erected that so we're seeing a vestige vestiges of a stone circle of might but there's another side to stonehenge uh, that i'll talk about but before i do there's two archaeologists called professor tim deville and the late Jeffrey Wainwright, they too believe it's a healing temple and they're from the University of Southampton and they uh, suggest it was for healing as well because they looked into the old myths like me. But there was another manuscript written about sort of 1700s, 1800s by John Wood. He's a, what we call an antiquarian and he said that it was being believed then that Stonehenge was an old Oracle Center, where it would you would go there, a bit like Delphi in Greece, where it's known to be an oracle center where people would get inspired by an oracle. And at Delphi in Greece, they were using natural hallucinogenics that come out of the ground through a fault line. Yeah. And that's been thoroughly investigated. Well, what I discovered about Stonehenge, and it was one of those eureka moments, I was looking at a very boring archaeological report about residue in pots. I mean, it's not very inspiring, but uh, I thought uh, I would read that to find out what was in these pots everybody was carrying. And if you imagine that in Catholicism, they have an incense pot and they swing it as they go down the church. That's what they did in medieval times, and they still do in England today day yeah and all the incense comes up and everybody feels good well they weren't using incense at stonehenge they were using opiates the the deposits in those incense pots were opiates so i think just like at delphi they were slightly in an altered state of consciousness and they were at the center of stonehenge and they were issuing an oracle and obviously john wood the antiquarian didn't know that i've only recently looked into these reports so yeah i think it was partly oracle partly healing as well and it was a center where people worldwide came from there's beads from egypt there was amber found from estonia this was a cosmopolitan healing oracle temple yeah going into the healing stuff we have a show with josh gates uh but he he went to stonehenge and i remember they had found like somebody that had migrated there to get healing healed and then came back to be buried there He's called the Amesbury Archer, and he was probably with Professor Mike Parker Pearson. He's the straight face of Stonehenge. And it's a shame Josh didn't get Professor Tim DeVille. Tim DeVille is, is, in my opinion, has a better understanding of Stonehenge. But nonetheless, that's the Amesbury Archer. Isot oxygen isotopes, little bits of enamel in your teeth, can tell you where you've grown up. And this person came from the Alps. He had a really bad knee. And so he got um, 
believed to be healing from there. And then he got reburied in a round barrow surrounding Stonehenge. So he's quite famous. And today you can see the Amesbury Archer in Salisbury Museum. They have the big display of him. He was probably very wealthy and he was probably one of the elite. Interesting. Yeah, no, we have not made it out to Stonehenge, so I find all this very, very fascinating. You talked about the long scold people earlier, and I know you talk about two different types. Do you want to describe the difference between the two? Yes, you have the, a natural skull that is long skulled. By long skulled, I mean not like the Paracus coneheads, the ones that come extended here. I mean, mine ends here, my skull, and it's quite rounded. Now, in the Neolithic time, <coughs> excuse me, going back by about five, six thousand years, the natural people of this land had long skulls. But some of the more elite or rulers or the high priests, the high priests were always part of kingship. Yeah, whether you're in Egypt, Turkey, wherever, that's how uh, it was, still is, if you're in England, incidentally, if you're still under a kingship. And they extended their skulls by probably boarding them uh, here. And you know when it's a uh, skull's being boarded because it leaves two scars here. Yeah, they're depression marks called a coronial depression mark. And that's what was found on the very long skull. And it seemed that the elite had the extended skulls and the kind of more of the, the common class uh, wouldn't extend their skulls. And that's seemingly how it was in the, the ancient world. But more than that, what I noticed in the reports by anthropologists, for instance, is that they kept reporting in the early Victorian period, right up to the 1930s, that their ear placement was different. So their ears were set further back. And I think that would have given them a very mythological appearance because maybe where we get the word fairies from, and there are spirits, you know, elementals like that. But I think when it came to the Irish interpretation of some of their legends to do with fairies, well, where did they go? into the mounds. What do we find in long mounds? The skulls. So I think they have, they were the origins of that mythology. Yeah, I'm not saying that all they were fairies, they were the or origins of. But more than that, I showed a report to a doctor that I know. She came to Egypt with me and she said, this is incorrect. This can't, this can't be. Why are they reporting it like this? She said, I don't understand it. That's not how our ears bones work and I said well what if it is true what if they were saying this is what we have found and she said they would probably hear differently so maybe their tone frequencies were different maybe they could hear earth energies maybe they could hear things that we can't today so I think we need to be very open-minded how we reinterpret things yeah and the long school as far as like boarding I think we've seen in like Native American tribes and like Central America too like, what about it? Like, why were they doing that? You think it was to tap into different frequencies? Yes, I, I think it was. Mm. And what I, I point out in my secret history of Stonehenge as well is a, a strange fact that during the Neolithic five 5,000 years ago, some of the long skulled, probably the priesthood or the elite, had a trepanned skull. What's a trepanned skull? Imagine that I have a circle cut out of my skull. That's what was being very commonly practiced by the, the Neolithic because you find a hole in the skull that's healed and then you find the piece of skull often buried with them. And what I noticed, again, by reading report after report and doing a lot of research was that their sutures closed early. That's where you about the age of 30, your your brain knits together, your skull knits together just to keep it simple. And a lot of people that have had modern day trepanning say that that stops the ability to have higher consciousness. It stops the ability to hear the heartbeat in the head. Sometimes you feel your heartbeat here, yeah? I could put my pulse now and I feel my heartbeat. You used to be able to feel that in your head and it could give you a higher experience. So I think they were practicing trepanum because they were a high conscious people, but they wanted to maintain that 
In England, we call um, the elite ladies, earls, dukes. We have lots of names for lots of posh people. And one lady in particular from Gloucestershire, uh, she was um, a duchess as well at one time. Uh, she did modern day trepanning. And she said that gave her higher consciousness. So I use her experience, look to the long skulled people and say, OK, your sutures closed early. And this could have been a way of maintaining your consciousness. Kind of going along that lines, do you think that's why maybe children have more experiences with like the paranormal? That's exactly what I say in my book. You're, you're straight there. Brilliant. Uh, yes, because they have that blood supply going much more fully to different uh, parts of the brain and with, within the skull. It's about the blood flow. Do you see what I mean? And once something kind of crosses over, that's when it's, it, it's there, obviously, but it's not how it was when you were younger. So I think a, a lot of uh, different kind of ghost spirit experiences, poltergeist experiences, it's uh, it's down to the more receptive side of what's in, in the skull. Uh, now that that's that's for sure. No, very fascinating. I uh, I was watching a video with you, uh, I think it was yesterday, with you and Andrew Collins about a fairy circle. And then you went in the fairy circle. Can you tell us what that is and then your experience in that? Well, I discovered that uh, because I'm around Avebury and uh, I was meeting up with Andy and I actually said for a joke, do you want to go sit in a fairy circle? <laughs> I wasn't actually being that serious, that said. Uh, but anyway, they they, they went uh, went along. What, what is a fairy circle? It's actually a mushroom circle. It's where mushrooms grow round like that. But previously, uh, unbeknown to Andy, and I can't remember if I said that on that video because I can't remember all the videos and what I say, but I had taken a woman there that was in a car accident. She came from America. She was quite traumatized still. And so I said, do you want to go into this, this fairy circle? Because it just had a magical feel about it. And don't forget what I said about a circle. Doesn't matter what that circle is. It will generate that form energy to manifest things on. That's why it's called form energy by magicians. And we went uh, in there and she had this great experience. So I said to uh, to Andy, why don't we go in there and see what we experienced? We did a, a meditation, I think, uh, I think there. But I think what was even better than that was that woman's experience. How did you feel before you went in there and after? And she just said, I'm different. I'm going to go home back to America different because of uh, a simple fa fairy circle. But it also is where it was placed. That fairy circle naturally grew by the largest man-made mound in northwest Europe called Silbury Hill. And uh, Mark Eddy, because I know you guys know Mark Eddy, he lives near the Grave Creek Mound in West uh, Virginia, I think it is. And that's very, very similar. It's almost identical. If you put those two together, it's like Silbury and uh, they're a mirror image of each other. And it was growing there on around some earth, earth currents as well. So combined all of that, I think if that fairy circle was in Maria's backyard, it may not have been so good as being very close to a female earth current that meanders around that area and a huge lay system uh, courses through Silbury as well. All of that combined makes that interesting. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And yeah, Mark's a great guy, so he helped set this one up. So thank you, Mark, if you're watching. Uh, Sam, before I completely hijack the episode, uh, do you have some more questions you want to ask? Yeah, do you want to get into like the feminine and male like energies and like that's, ley lines? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a really good question because yes, yeah, some of the the energies do have gender. You know, like a male uh, solar. We tend to think of them as solar and lunar, rather than male and female for ley. So some are more receptive to the moon cycles and some are more receptive to the sun cycles you know like the summer solstice the spring equinox but there's also other lines that uh if you like sedona is very famous for its vortex energy is it not i've been to sedona what's not to like about certain some areas and it has that um 
crazy energy with the people there as well, which I, I find quite uh, attractive to that place. So if you imagine you've got uh, two vortexes reasonably close to each other, I mean, they don't have to be like that. They could be some distance away, but they're relatively close. Uh, you often get in terms of uh, vortex, one male and one female. So we can put that idea to vortex energy as well. And if you have a male and a female uh, vortex close to each other, they generate those energies and then they blend and it becomes a hermaphrodite line, neither male or female. So we have that that's been closely studied. And uh, again, I take people out and I, I really went beyond what's called the Dragon Project, which was, you know, back with Paul Devereaux in the 70s and 80s testing for things. Well, they weren't testing Earth energies. They were just taking equipment into a, a stone circle and going, what's going on? I started to test Earth energies like this. Is it true? Is it going to be? And we got a really good beat coming out of a vortex. It was changing its Hertzian frequency every 10 seconds seconds uh you could count it when it was good so it's going like up like 10 20 30 40 do you see what i mean it was going up and then coming down and going up and coming down so when we would put that to the control area it didn't have that so we do have male and female energies but hermaphrodite as well which is both and i think that is real balance in the landscape when we have those hermaphrodite energy lines and they are very profound people pick up uh, on those and you often people often hear things above those as well so that's another interesting kind of supernatural aspect to some earth energies you can heighten your sense of hearing or vision as well that is pretty cool thank you uh, before we end off do you want to talk about the music of the spheres Oh, yes, that's one of my really personal discoveries that uh, is really, really heartfelt because uh, uh, Kepler, uh, he was uh, an astronomer in the sort of, you know, Renaissance time, 16th, 17th century. And previously you had Pythagoras. We've all heard of Pythagoras We're normally from school days. And they said that the orbital kind of planet where the planets orbit and if you apply those circles in space, just imagine like Mercury's orbit and Mars orbit and their mathematical relationship can equate to a musical interval. And what I realized by some of those circular Earth energy patterns I was telling you about earlier, I was working with a mathematician and we were looking at all the mathematical sides of the, the music of the spheres. And suddenly I went, well, hang on, Richard, Richard Cardrew, the late Richard Cardrew. I said, well, this is happening in the Earth. This is what I douse. This is and he and we looked at it and it's coming up as music as well. Now, the Christians use a musical tone called the major third. What does the major third do then? Well, it heightens your consciousness. So as you're singing it in a Gothic cathedral, let's add in all of those kind of wonderful areas in, uh, in medieval England or Europe, you're heightened your consciousness. The Masons know this. Their frequency that they use is called E flat. Mm -hmm. So their music tends to have that predominant note. So all of these different music can uh, influence our consciousness. But because it's coming up from the earth naturally, then that's influencing us as we're walking into that energy field. For, for instance, if I was, you know, around in the 18th and 19th century, well, not that old, but if I was around in the 18th and 19th century, then I would know exactly if they were playing in an A key. Oh, that means I'm going to be upset. They knew what music meant. Do you see what I mean? We've kind of lost that. So we don't, I don't think when I listen to a band, ah, that's the Masonic E flat. I don't think like that anymore, but our ancestors certainly did. They would know exactly the meaning of music. Now at Stonehenge, if you stand in the right place, then you're standing on the major third, which is what, like I said, the Christians use to change your consciousness. If you stand in another place, you're on an octave and that can raise you up a little bit more. Then you have the devil's music completely banned by the Christians, okay? They feared the uh, the devil's music, so what's that? 
in horror films, it's called a tritone. And a tritone is what makes that horror movie, oh, a little bit edgy. Uh -uh. The note can't change. It doesn't flow. In, in music, a note will flow into another one, but uh, a tritone won't. It goes mm -mm, like that. So that's the devil's music. Now, in terms of ancient sites, they incorporated the devil's music, tritones. And but it was a still point in time because the music can't go anywhere. Do you see what I mean? That's why it has those two very famous notes. And it creates a still point in a stone circle where you can have a transcendental experience. That's why the Christians banned it. They didn't want to have anyone experience a transcendental state other than then telling them the word of God. Yeah, they could experience it at places like Stonehenge by knowing these musical intervals, which I know that they did because they wrote about them uh, in the later uh, centuries. So music can be maths as well. So a major third is five over four. And that's its mathematical uh, equation. But, you know, when we talk about maths, people glaze over. So I, what I would say is it's just music that is natural, inaudible to the ear. But Kepler and Pythagoras said the soul can hear that music. OK, so I think on a maybe on a very deep level within our inner consciousness, we m can hear the music of the spheres, those planetary tones. And through the earth, through my discovery, we can also feel the uh, earth harmonics. So there's so much going on at a stone circle from lace to mass to, to music all designed and coming together as an ancient temple that can heal and change your consciousness and give you a transcendental alchemic experience. That's the megalithic wonders of the ancient world. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for explaining that to us. And it definitely opens up the eyes and the mind to a lot of different, you know, things that perhaps have been lost for a lot of times. Uh, one kind of off the beat question, say our viewers or perhaps us were in town visiting Stonehenge. Uh, where's a place you'd recommend to grab a bite to eat? Well, Stonehenge is in quite an isolated place. So uh, it's got a, a kind of cafe there that it doesn't have very good uh, food. But I would say my top tip would go into the nearest town of Amesbury. And there's some really nice old fashioned inns and pubs. You have the George Hotel there. It's you guys would like it. It's got a few hauntings going on and it's got good food and it's got good beer. Uh, or you know uh, alcohol and coffees you can have have what you like there but it's atmospheric so you're going from one part of ancient England at its most ancient to something dating back to the 1800s and it, it has an old area where the horse and carriages used to go and it really does have an ambiance so that would be my top tip if you go in there in, in the evening have a really nice beer if you go in there in early morning have a wonderful coffee and a good old English breakfast well yeah thank you so much well definitely when we can get out there we'll check it out and uh for viewers and listeners where can they find more about you your books videos stuff like that Absolutely. I mean, always buy direct from an author because uh, Amazon tried to get 60% out of all of my sales now. So I'm really trying to encourage people to go to my website, which are the Avebury, that's A V E B U R Y, the Avebury Experience dot co dot uk or you can go to esoteric college dot com which is my teaching platform because i teach many different courses or you can go to my landing page that will take you to all of those sites which is really easy it's maria wheatley dot uk so that's that's an easy one that can take you to all of uh, those sites and i am going to be in charco canyon on the 25th and the 26th so if you guys want to uh, make your make your way there or anyone would want to come and learn dowsing from me i'm going to be in charco then and it's a wonderful wonderful place and we'll be going up to aztec ruins as well oh very cool yeah well i'll have to see if we can uh, wander down there and uh, check it out ourselves well thank you for uh, joining us this has been really engaging i have a lot more questions but i know we've hit our hour 
Uh, so we'll have to have you back and we'll we'll do some more discussions if you'd like. Absolutely. We're in good company. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and great re- weekend, you know, and uh, have a great day. So thank you again. Yeah, you've been good company. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. So once again, Sam and I want to say thank you to Maria for joining us and just giving us such an excellent interview. Honestly, this was so much fun. And me and Sam learned a ton. And honestly, we'd even cover half the uh, the stuff. So we have so much more content we can go over in a follow-up. Uh, but make sure before then you guys actually go uh, to those links and learn a little bit more about Maria and check out her books and her website and stuff like that. But until next time, guys, for more Cools interviews, click that link to your left. For more about us here at Cools Paranormal, click that link to your right. And don't forget to hit that like and give us a subscribe. And let us know, what was your favorite part of this interview? And is there something you want us to ask Maria in a follow-up interview? Tell us in the comments below.